Welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. We are your hosts, Dr. Scott Hoy, clinical psychologist, and Kyle Miller, licensed counselor. Psychology Talk is a unique conversation about psychology around the globe. We speak with psychology experts to keep you informed about current issues and trends. We advocate toward reducing stigma and educate about mental health. While you're listening, Please take a moment to give us a review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, or your favorite streaming service. It helps us to continue providing you with quality programming. And now, enjoy the episode. Uh, talking about things. What am I going to say? I, was, I have to have an opening here. Hello, everyone. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Scott Schiaffo. Scott's an actor, musician, composer, author, and counselor. Uh, what else would we say about you? Uh, that's actually really, you know, plenty. I mean, I, uh, today will be to, today. He's here to talk to me about his his life, the universe, and everything. How's that? Yeah, that sounds fine to me. I'm um, going to keep that as the cold opener. Then we can just get going. I have sure. I, <laughs> I, you know, I have the masters, and I did the. Oh God, I'm drawing a blank. What do you uh, before you graduate? You do your oh, you do your internship. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I did the internship, but uh, after I graduated, that was the end of it. I, I didn't go into the field at all, really. I know, so, but you, but technically, you, you have your counseling degree, How's right? That? Yeah. And I've got, yeah, I'm I got still, it. I still have my NC, my um, I still got my national accreditation. Although I'm gonna, I owe the due soon to keep that up. To, you know, to keep the NCC. Oh yeah, so you you basically took what the the exam the exam right. and then you passed that and you were you were start starting to work and and you didn't quite get the, get the three million hours that you have to have post uh, right gra- yeah you know, graduation. Not even, yeah not close just just because of my whole other situation with my heart and my dis because I was on disability for quite a while from my heart yeah 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 so yeah it's uh it was like a labor a very expensive labor of love to get that degree because I love the field. Yeah, well, I mean, what we could talk about today, I mean, we, we kind of set this up earlier when we, 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 uh, kvetched about like how we, what are we going to do and what would we talk about? And, and the idea, of course, would be to kind of talk about your life trajectory. Um, you are someone who's in recovery successfully for many, many years. And also, uh, you know, we're both, I'm a former actor. You're still, you're still acting out there. I mean, um, you're still, uh, pretty heavily involved in creative stuff, music, doing scores and stuff and your own, your own music, wrote a book, right. About somewhat autobiographically, right. About your experiences, uh, when you weren't in recovery. Uh, right. Yeah. It's, it's more like a, it's more like a poor man's Charlie Bukowski trip is what it was. Yeah, but still you know, still a fine little book. I mean, yeah. Oh, I'm very happy. I mean, I'm very happy it finally came out because it, it resonated with people in a very Let, in a way I never saw coming. Let's let's get that title out there. Is what is the title? Vicious of it? Dog. Yeah. Vicious Dogs Attack Me in Sleepless Nights of Summer. Okay, that's that's not yeah. a good summer. <laughs> that's, yeah. It is yeah, kind that's, of that's Bukowski-esque, yeah. Well, how do, how did this book resonate? What is what is it specifically about? And and maybe we can kind of like use that as a launching off a point. I uh, think I think what has happened, which I didn't see coming when I was releasing it, is it's not it does it, it doesn't promote the lifestyle, and it's not apologetic for the lifestyle. It just sort of is. It's it's, it's sort of like an alcoholic junkie memoir. Um, a good five, six, seven, eight years worth of bizarreness under the influence. But because we all know, thankfully, for my sake, mostly, I survived and I'm okay now, somehow they, there's a recovery element in it that's not, that's not technically in it. But because I am okay now and I'm out and about and active, people realize that I've recovered. And I think that the recovery, the recovery element uh, was touching people in a way I didn't foresee because it's not a recovery book. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, what are, what are, what's some of, how is it resonating with people and how is it touching people in that way? Well, a lot of people who have gotten, you know, given me feedback and reached out to me over the years who have uh, purchased the book and, and, 
and uh, a lot a lot of them suffer with their own addictions and the, you know the the feeling of knowing somebody that they because you know how it is it's kind of like with something like a clerks which I got incredibly lucky as an actor as a character actor to be in a film where I played a character that's fairly memorable yeah, the, the, the fans the Chulie's gum rep yeah right, right. The, the fans really kind of remember him <laughs> and he's kind of an asshole but yet people really like him and like me as a person which I always found interesting because the character is pretty despicable but um <laughs> uh, was that, that's the point I'm trying to make here um Oh gosh, I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought. Well, we were talking about the the, the how the book resonated with the people, and then we kind of got into <laughs> right, the, yeah. right. A lot, a lot of people who suffer were identified with the fact that somebody they know from the screen, because people feel like they really do know you with a film like that, because it's the kind of movie that if you're a fan, you've sat through it like Rocky Horror, like dozens of times in your life. Right, yeah. So you really begin to feel like you know the people on screen, which of course you don't at all. But they felt so close to all the characters that to find out one of them was really drowning in alcoholism and drug addiction and made their way through it by whatever grace you want to say, mm -hmm. I think it's given the people that are suffering or have had friends and family suffer, something very tangible to sort of identify with and to have hope for, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it shows you that people suffer, maybe, basically everybody from all walks of life, that we suffer from our own internal uh, vicious dogs, right? Yeah. Without a doubt. Well, not, nobody gets out of this gig without, I don't care what kind of childhood you had, storybook or nightmarish, everybody has their shit. Everybody. And if you don't deal with it, it eventually deals with you. Yeah, absolutely. You have to, you have to wrestle with your own demons, right? Or angels. And um, it just... It's just nobody's unaffected by pain and suffering, right? It's the hero's journey, and yeah. hopefully you, you turn it into a hero's journey rather than uh, just kind of like stagnant, right? And if you, you, we all reach those points in our life where I think things work as coping skills or, or ways of getting by in life uh, that don't work anymore. But you know, sometimes some of us don't realize it until very later on that yeah. uh, it ain't the way to go twenty four seven, right? Or anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's having that insight and figuring out you need to get your, your crap together. Uh, but you did, and, and the book is resonating with people, and, and you just created an audio book of it, correct? You did uh, record all, the, all of the chapters, right? Correct. Uh, thank you to the pandemic. <laughs> you had a lot of time on your hand. Is that what right? You're exactly. <laughs> Finally, because originally, years ago, when the film, when the book was first released, we were going. There was a budget and everything. We were going to do a uh, thing where there was going to be a lot of guest readers, actors, friends of mine were going to read, and uh, comics I knew were going to read, and you know, no, no A listers per se. Maybe one or two people who were bigger names than others. But uh, it was going to be all guest readers. But Audible, fast forward, Audible wasn't, Audible of today was not what it was when the book came out. Audible was not the monster that it is now. And Audible strongly suggested to me that if you're going to do that, that's fine. But do that as a novelty release. Do the author version, just you reading it, because you're the guy and you're in those films and people are going to want to hear that. Um, and if you're going to do the other thing, do that more as a novelty version. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, we, we talked about clerks a little bit. What are some of the, uh, some of the other things you've been working on just in case people want to like check them out? I know, uh, you were in vulgar, right? Which was like a early 2000, uh, Right, right. Yeah. That was another hairy film, uh, crazy, crazy independent film by a guy named Brian Johnson, who's part of the Kevin Smith world. Uh, Lionsgate released that, and um, 
very controversial film. Um, yeah, it was about a, a clown who's like abused, right, or raped. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I, again, I go head to head with Brian O'Halloran, which is kind of nice. Uh, our two characters are going head to head, and uh, you know, I've got the big standoff scene with the police. I mean, what character actor doesn't want to have a big standoff with the police? That's you know, <laughs> tell, you know, telling them fuck off and you won't take me alive type shit. And what's funny, it's funny to me now, but I didn't tell too many people at the time. Granted, it wasn't real close to some of my incidents, but I was no stranger to getting in the crosshairs of the men in blue back in those days. Like, that was not that big a stretch. Yeah, okay, so so you <laughs> you, you did your prep work. Yeah, no, I had plenty of years of research. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I've had some rough nights. Uh, I, I think, I think you know, anybody who's like acted, uh, you, it's kind of like you're on a manic high for a while and then you go into a depression and then you like, there's a lot of booze or there can be, there can be some drugs involved in after parties if you're doing theater or, you know, movies or things. It's, it's kind of a crazy scene. Uh, is that how you, is that how you found yourself kind of like getting into, uh, into trouble? Well, that's a part of it. I think, uh, personally, I think I was destined for a number of reasons. Uh, it's in the blood. My father was a slamming alcoholic. Mm. Uh, I had uncles on my mother's side of the family that were slamming alcoholics. Uh, it was a lot in the family, um, so I know there, I do believe heavily in the genetic predisposition. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So I know that was ripe and ready to happen. And uh, so I probably no matter what I had done or what paths I may have taken, I think I would have fell into it because it was a love affair as soon as I sort of found it in a sense. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people speak of it like that, like it's uh, almost like a girlfriend. I mean, I, my, some of my training was in, a lot of my training was in drug and alcohol uh, facilities, uh, oddly, because I've had my own experiences with those things. Um, but it, it is spoken of like it's, you know, like your habit can be kind of like a relationship. Yeah. A, and, a, and a twisted one. Oh, sure. Very dysfunctional, obviously. But it's like, you know, there's a funny line in Clerks where Dante is, is talking with Randall about he's talking about his childhood. And his mother said that he was one never to rock the boat or to he would sit in a dirty diaper rather than learn to potty train. Hmm. And this is that this is the character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of us will sit in our own shit forever before we take what it takes to get out of that shit. You know, like it's it's familiar. And that's the unfamiliar is what scares the shit out of most alcoholics and addicts. The familiar, you know, people wonder, why does he keep doing this? His life's insane. He ends up in jail and he ends up on blackouts where he he comes to in places he doesn't remember and but as mad as 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 full of madness as that is that was familiar enough to be comfortable after a while the yeah. unknown yeah. was more uncomfortable well i think that's that metaphor applies not just to people with uh addiction problems but like People of all walks of life, I think everybody just kind of simmers in their own diapers, right? Until they get uncomfortable, until the diapers get really cold and uncomfortable. You know. Right, or you start chafing. <laughs> <laughs> start chafing and they get leaky and stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's gross. But I, I think it, it is very much a metaphor for uh, how people work. And yeah, it's just unfortunately, uh, it can kind of, take a turn for the worse in, in other incident, incidences. I wonder, like, what, what got you... I don't think we've ever really talked about this, Scott. Like, what got you into going into counseling? Why, why did you decide to, to take that route? You love the field, and, and uh, I'm just curious. I assume that's one of the reasons why, but, but why? 
uh, into counseling to study it or into counseling in my personal life? Because that was a big part of it. Well, to study it, but I guess maybe that's what got you into wanting to be a counselor because you you took up counseling and psychotherapy, yeah. Right. I was in therapy a large chunk of my adult life. And although, you know, I struggled and I never really cleaned up fully until I finally did, I got the most uh, clarity and the most enjoyable, excuse me, sobriety through one-on-one counseling over the 12 step programs and the meetings and those type of things I was never a big fan of the 12 step programs, but I felt like I got more out of one-on-one therapy. I had a handful of very good one-on-one therapists throughout the years. And I just fully believed in the process. I was a big Carl Rogers guy. And yeah. although he, you know, that could be in the wrong hands, that could be deadly in the sense of, unconditional positive regard for somebody who's either a narcissist or like just so self-absorbed, that's not going to help. But positive, you know, unconditional positive regard for somebody who's kind of being told they're a piece of shit from just about everybody is uh, one of the most uh, exhilarating and refreshing things you could have or feel. Yeah, just being heard, right? I was speaking to somebody I had a guest on a couple of days or a day ago, and we were talking about how to hold space for people who might be depressed and suicidal, and, and what to do, what to do for them. And my my feeling is is largely if you can just be there and listen, because they don't feel attended to, or there's an immense amount of shame for the feelings that they have that are are dragging them into that kind of headspace where they want to kill themselves right and part of it is 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 accepting that they do want to not that you want to you know convince them that it's a good idea or anything but to hold that space so they feel heard you know so many of us we're so interconnected now with this that and the other screen but we're so disconnected from each other as human beings right and absolutely and you know i I think a big part of it, too, is what you touched on, being heard, being genuinely heard. And most people, in my experience and also from my own experience, you want to be heard and understood. I don't we don't want the answer necessarily. We don't want to be fixed this is what the bad thing. The issue with men and, man, and mansplaining is a big thing in the sense of men fall into a terrible trap with women when instead of listening to their woman go on about something that's bothering them, they try to fix it and put a band aid on it and move on. And that's not what's wanted. They just want to be heard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes it can be the other way around. Like, you know, I know people who have relationships who, where the woman wants to like to come up with a solution, depending on, I guess it depends on how much of these quote and quote unquote masculine or feminine archetype or, or aspects of the personality there. Like somebody, somebody whose uh, wife might be a professional or just has like a, comes from a family of fixer uppers, right? Where you, you fix right. a problem and you don't talk about your emotions. So it's not always men, but, uh, I think, right. yes, by and large, it is what men want to do, which is, of course, to not go into emotional stuff, right? I think men, we tend to, we don't like to feel things. We feel, we start to feel emotions. We get like off balance. Like we're not supposed to have those things. Yeah. Well, well you, it's so much that's inbred in us. And I, raised by a very strong single mother, I was in a, to this day, I still am in a lot of ways pretty much an emotional, nervous wreck. Uh, I, I, I know how to handle it now, and I, I, I'm much better at it than I have been most of my life. But I'm an extremely uh, emotional, extremely anxiety-ridden individual, even on a good day. And um not sure where I'm going with that, but you're right. It's uh, well. You, you, it sounds like you, you you're in touch with those emotions, but sometimes to the point where they're overwhelming. 
Right, absolutely. And it's important that you're just feeling the right amount of empathy and the right amount of support and nobody necessarily is trying to fix all your problems. They just want to say, hey, man, that must suck. I feel for you. I'm sure. I, I believe most of us do know somewhere in there. For me, with, with therapy, my, my ultimate goal would have been, once if I were in practice, aside from the positive, you know, the unconditional positive regard, was I think the ultimate thing I wanted to do was help somebody learn how to navigate themselves to their own solutions. Well, yeah, you know, that, that is kind of other, therapy in a nutshell, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah, but there is other therapies where there people really want to be told what to do. Give me A, B, and C. Some people want that in a pragmatic way. There are some people and there are some therapists who work that way. Uh, yeah, I, I think that you're, you're kind of looking at like rational emotive behavioral therapy right. or or CBT, CBT or ACT. Right. But but those, you know what, if you watch those people work, like the people, if you've ever watched Aaron Beck or Judith Beck, for instance, the CBT gods or two of the, the creators of it, or if, uh, um, David Burns, right? He's even like gone away from that he's, he's like i'm not really cbt i just was part of that crowd it seemed to work when they do it they do it with panache and if you watch like judith beck if you watch her doing therapy on video she's doing it she looks like a carl rogers she looks like a, a person-centered or client-centered therapist for a great period of time while she's doing the work right so and it's and then she might bring in like a Socratic dialogue to do something. It's a lot more subtle than it's the way it's being trained, because right. it, because it's it's this, this you know it, it has been manualized because it's got all those like Likert scales and you know ways to measure things pre, pre and post. So all the insurance companies were freaking out about how great it was, but you know the efficacy right, because, studies. Yeah, and the, that yeah, you yeah. bring up a great point. They want results within a window well it's impossible insurance yeah. companies yeah. of course yeah. yeah yeah uh but you you basically you, you were on to something i think that's that's basically what you would have been doing in psychotherapy to to one degree or level or another i mean if, I, if somebody comes in and they want solution oriented stuff or they want like they want something that's more cbt kind of oriented solutions right the trick is, and I hope I don't lose anybody from my caseload who might be spying in on this. Um, the trick is to convince them, you know, to show them a little hope with those techniques, but then to kind of bring them around to the fact that they still have to accept who the hell they are, right? Which is the unconditional positive regard, positive or, regard uh, right. the, the therapeutic alliance, whatever, you know, the, the transference, counter-transference stuff, like how, however you deal with that. So, yeah, I, I think that the nuts and bolts of therapy is still the same. Uh, sure. Yeah. But so you you did the counseling degree and uh, uh, it sounds like some health conditions didn't allow you to continue with that as a, as a, a like to, to launch into getting those those hours and then setting up your own practice right or going you know chasing after the lac or the lpc rather mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. as opposed to even the lac was a daunting task because of the disability and then i had kicked around the idea of just doing pro bono and was even offered a gig at the place i did my internship um but uh I, I, I love I, I love everything about the talk therapy field. I just always have. I believe in it. I believe that for me, I guess this is how we maybe you can agree being an actor too. I got into it because I got into acting because I'm fascinated by people and I'm fascinated by my own behavior, let alone other people's behavior. And studying it and observing it and and not always not the, the key is you're not always going to understand what's behind somebody's M.O. Uh, and playing characters that no matter how possibly despicable have 
other redeeming qualities, you know, we're human beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I basically got into uh, psych because, because of acting, right? I was looking, I think I, we were talking about this earlier. Uh, I was interested, I, I, I was really interested in Michael Chekhov's techniques. I didn't study any, his techniques under, under anybody who was training people in them. But uh, the idea of using like uh, imagery, uh, it's very much like hypnotic techniques, right? You know, and uh, I said, well, I, I, hypnosis is cool. I was studying some NLP stuff. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll do some hypnosis. So I, I got certified uh, by uh, an organization uh, that you know, technically they'll give anybody a diploma, that kind of a thing. And, <laughs> and I worked, but I, I was very diligent about like pursuing like the heavy hitters within that, the, the field who were actually like psychiatrists or like Milton Erickson, right? So I, okay, I became, yeah. I started, I basically worked at a, a Positive Changes franchise in Manhattan and in uh, Bay Ridge, beautiful Bay Ridge, um, wow. doing you know, hypnosis, sometimes 12 hours a day with people, just mini short-term wow. therapy stuff with people and open up my own practice, right? Because it's not regulated in most states, I think outside of Texas. So I was doing these mini therapy sessions with like very just simple brief behavior changes, but I was seeing people who obviously had deep personality issues that were potentially life-threatening. And I would have to like tell the family or the person, here's a, here's a, card for a psychiatrist you and you go see them and talk to them i obviously saw what was not within my bandwidth of helping people and that's gotcha. that's largely what, what what got me back into i i tossed myself into the role you could say of being a therapist and and i enjoyed it so i tested i tested the waters pretty heavily having had some therapy myself earlier as well but i tested right. the waters pretty heavily in that role so uh, it, it just seemed to fit well. And, and, and yes, I think there's a lot of overlap between how therapy works when it's working well. And people, when, when graduates from programs step into that role and they embody themselves wholly, I think there's a lot of similarities between like acting and, and therapy. That doesn't mean, oh, I, it doesn't I, mean I, you're putting anybody on when you're doing therapy, Right. But there are some elements to it that are very similar. Absolutely. And uh, I think I was so excited for you to watch you uh, continue to grow and do and pursue it after working with you in the film, because you were one of my favorite people in that cast. And that's oh, thanks. Just yeah, true. That's uh, uh, you you had that other level of something i mean there's something there's an intangible you can't always put your finger on for me with other actors and uh it kind of jumps through the screen it it jumps through the camera uh it's something that i think either somebody has or they don't have it can't really be taught um I, that's how i feel about about some of that and i saw a lot of that in you oh, oh and okay. i also and i loved your uh the the piece you did um with the tome oh uh the like the spoken word thing no, no i'm not forgetting the, the name of it where you were the ant antiquarian oh 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 wow. yeah yeah I'm, I'm, you're dragging up my acting past here on my podcast right. <laughs> right. yes no the hapless antiquarian that, right. uh, yeah, that was a basically. wonderful piece well you was... really visually you and without dialogue you really brought it well, I, I, uh, I, you know, I, I am a teenage Ed Gorey character. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I belong. I, I think, I think I belong secretly. I stepped out of the pages of Amphigoria or whatever. You know the. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think I think everything came together with that film. Uh, my friend Anthony Penta, who's now uh, directing, he's directing and producing a, uh, an indie. A documentary which is really cool called we kill for love it's about the um 
erotic thriller markets precisely the thing that back when clerks came out right when i saw that in the theater when it first came out right like 92 or 94 or something, 93, yeah, 93, 93, yeah. yeah. I, theatrically yeah 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 theatrically and, and uh i saw it in the state theater in ann arbor right and like wow this is cool like indie films and and, and but at the same time there was this whole like burgeoning um straight to home video erotic thriller market right which is when blockbuster was still around and so so sure. so, so tony's doing this really pretty in-depth interview with all the directors and the actors from that whole period which uh almost got swept away i mean except for i think there's a there's some interest in, in film criticism about that genre and how it's distinct from film noir and and other things and uh, but sure yeah so he's doing that but his 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 uh Humble. His humble start was uh, things like, uh, you know, an, an H.P. Lovecraft adaptation of The Hound, which is verbatim, and and uh, that uh, hapless antiquarian film. Yeah. So. Yeah. That, that. I mean, that. That was great stuff. It really was, and it takes a. It takes a deeper mind to be doing that as opposed to a lot of. I don't want to call other. You know, insult anybody and say other things are fluff. But that's a uh, uh, sort of a um, what's the word I want? Um, there was a there was a sophistication to that production. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, you have to think about it. It's it's a riff on Ed Gorey's like little little tomes, right? And it is a book about a book, and it's got a kind of Lovecraftian book in it. It's it's like it's got a whole lot going on. There's a lot of meta 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 stuff there. Right, right. <laughs> it's and like, it's beautiful too. The, a film about is something because now where we are with books, and you know, twenty thirty years later now bookstores have almost all but vanished and yeah you know I, I miss i do miss the old days of bookstores and record stores and dvds and laser discs and oh my everything. god but, yeah yeah i mean speak of the 90s man i used to work in bookstores i worked at the first borders books that was in ann arbor i mean wow it was a it was a strange it, it was great i mean it was great it, it was just amazing it didn't make me a whole lot of money but i had a good time it was a lot of fun, you know, and I hear cool you. people. And just the fact that people would go in and talk about ideas, right? A place where you could get a cup of coffee, you could hang out, you could ask somebody who worked at a bookstore who probably was knowledgeable in their subject matter. Yeah, yeah it was a great place. Exactly. Great time, I guess, uh, for for the, the landline years. Yeah, I tell you, man. I, in fact, I was just talking to Carrie. My partner in crime, mm -hmm. my, my lovely Jewel Carey, uh, technology, even recently, like we, we did, we had been doing web design for a number of years back in the very late 90s into the early 2000s. And we kept it right up to current day, but I didn't stick with technology with that. I went to the music and the film technology, still did web work. But I didn't keep up with it. But the point I'm, I'm getting to is uh, never did I see uh, that the how the phone has become everything. Like oh, our, yeah. Yeah. our phones are our computers and our cameras. Yeah, uh, the like cameras are like, yeah, yeah. movies on their phones. That's just so bonkers. It's it's insane. They're like little Star Trek technologies, right? You know, and plus they're, they're tra transitional objects. You can't leave home without it. It's like a teddy uh, bear. It, it's yeah. mind blowing. Yeah. Um, what's going on for you now? Like, what are what are uh, projects that are in the works? Well, we uh, you know I do have uh, probably will be involved on some level in Kevin's Clerks three sequel. Kevin mm -hmm. Smith. Um, I did a lot of work over COVID, actually. I, I was as part of a couple of films that actually were produced and were distributed and wow. got their audience and uh, a web series, which was a lot of fun. But I was doing more of the music for that than I was on camera. Um, I, I'm very fortunate. I stay busy. A lot of it is indie wackiness and and whatnot, but uh, I, I I love it and 
I feel fortunate and blessed that although I've always juggled a number of things to keep the nut covered, as they say, um, that I've been able to do that with other choices, obviously. Uh, I, I never was never married. I don't have any dependents. So that makes it keeps me very free to have that sort of feast or famine lifestyle, which it is. Sometimes there's fun money. Sometimes there's no fun money. But I love the fact that I get to stay in the creative arts and things like the convention worlds and uh, a lot of promotional things that came up over the years as the culture changed. Clerks became a thing that I was able to monetize through a different through many different means as opposed to the old school way, which was you got paid to be an actor and then you got your residuals. Mm -hmm. uh, a new model was a film reaches a certain popularity and all of a sudden on the convention circuit, you become a, a bigger fish in a smaller pond. And then there's, 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 there's revenue streams to be made through that. Awesome. So, so, so that, that's, yeah. So selling selling your book, for instance, or things right. like that. Yeah. So, yeah, doing the meet and greet. You sell, you know, you sell the items uh, with the meet and greet and the selfies and the uh, uh, personalizing the items and you know, because let's face it, too, you could probably uh, identify with this. As a child, uh, all I could think about was music or acting and like fantasizing, like, oh, my God, to have a career would be so amazing. Like th just the notion that somebody would ask for an autograph was mind blowing. But then you fast forward 30 years later and now there's this whole culture where there's uh, it's a revenue stream. <laughs> yeah. You know, which I never saw that coming, which at first was a little uncomfortable for me because it just seemed because we grew up at a different time, you know, well, but then you, you, you're on the dais with people like Adam West and William Shatner. I was going to say, yeah, yeah. You know, you know the, the clock is, you know, the meter's running with those cats. But but like Star Trek conventions were big back in the 70s, man. I remember like I, reading magazine articles about like people going to these conventions and thinking, wow, I wouldn't do it now per se. But like back then when I was like really into like, you know, Star Trek, the, the first series. I, yeah, that would have been cool to meet, you know, Leonard Nimoy and, and William Shatner sure. and whatnot, George Takai. But it, <laughs> that's been going on forever i i think actors yeah. have, have uh like like i think your eyes open up in a field you know past you you, you what's the what's the silly term now you jump the shark pretty quick or you, you push the envelope or whatever whatever the term is right like you figure out that the, that there's more to life than just being in front of a camera or on a stage right with, with what you can do right Right. And because of the way things have changed so drastically in the business, uh, DVDs almost being dead. And that was a big revenue stream for a lot of film companies and for actors. Uh, direct to DVD used to be a very big thing. Now it's direct to streaming. Yeah. But the, the profits that are available from streaming as opposed to the tactile DVDs are night and day. You're getting like micro pennies per stream as oh. opposed to with a DVD, you literally would, you know, do the dollars and cents of it has changed amazingly. Like no, crazy. No, yeah, I, I agree. Like, uh, Many years, like, oh, God, it's like 2012, I, I did something through, and uh, you, you know, it's a very popular platform. I won't mention it, but like, I put an album out, and yeah, a few people bought it, and I don't think I've actually paid off what I put into, like, purchasing equipment and whatnot to, to make it. But, you know, the worst thing about it is that platform now no longer will sell an album for you. So like if anybody, so like you, I, I don't think you're going to actually buy an album. I think maybe you can through Amazon, 
But it's all streaming now. Who the hell is going to buy that that album or any album? I was listening it's, to the Stones last week in Iggy Pop, and I didn't buy it, man. I'm just streaming it. Uh, right, you know, right. You're absolutely right. And I know, and I know what, I, yeah, I know what they get per stream. It's right. just like a million people are going to listen to Iggy Pop all over the world. They're not going to listen to me, right? But then even Iggy is not getting those royalty yeah. checks that he would have if they were actually buying discs. It's a completely different world. Yeah. Uh, and it's funny you bring up Amazon. They they cut their program this summer. Oh. So now it's all streaming. And I have a number of titles on Amazon, wow. DVDs and uh, audio CDs. And now it's streaming only. No more. Uh, hard copies. Wow. Okay. So Heartbreaking. Means, yeah. So, yeah. So that's that's an income revenue for the artists. I, you know, we're, uh, I think that basically whoever controls the uh, who he who controls the spice controls the universe, and the spice, my friend, is the gatekeeper. And whatever the platform is, yeah, that's gonna they're gonna make the the cash. The Baron Harkonnens of the world are gonna make the cash. You know, um, Bezos. Yeah. So. So when you, I was curious, you mentioned the conventions, like, and talking about the book there, what's your interaction? Because we've had somebody on, uh, Susanna Flores, who wrote a book about the Wolverine as a PTSD survivor, and she kind of interweaves her own PTSD survival story in it. And oh, she, nice. she's gone to comic book cons and, and, and sold and plugged her book, but she, she mentions a lot of like being, a, people coming up and saying, I, you know, just being in tears saying, I I finally understood why I was behaving this way and I'm not alone. Like so do you get kind of some of that from from vicious dogs? I do actually. Uh and again it's it's people and the stigma with alcoholism and drug addiction is it's still a pretty terrible thing. Uh yeah. it, alcoholism and drug addiction elicits some of the most fierce resentment and anger and confusion from family members and society that you could imagine. And it's a terrible, terrible thing because, yes, the alcoholic and addict needs to be accountable for what they do. Yet, by the same token, so much of what they do, somebody else is behind the wheel. So it's mm. it's a heartbreaking scenario and families just get crushed by it. But um, I've gotten a lot of that uh, over the years since the book has come out. And it, to me, I didn't see that coming at all. Uh, but it was, it was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to uh, get to a deeper level of communication with the fans when it was appropriate, whether it was through a Facebook message or in person at a convention um, and I'm very open about speaking about all of it. So, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm glad you're able to touch people that way, and and they can kind of they can put a face to a name that they admire through a really awesome film uh, and an awesome career, and uh, see precisely how everyone's human. Yes, yes, and we're super frail. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, in our frailty, I think that's where we find our resilience, you know, our strength. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, have you ever thought about writing a bit of an autobiography? I mean, I think we, we mentioned that before, like talking about like your 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 recovery and your experience and whatnot, like uh, maybe through the lens of your, your counseling uh, um, education. Yeah, uh, on and off now for like the last seven or eight years, I had actually begun a project with the, uh, there's an artist named Scott Meany, who I've done a lot of work with, who's just a phenomenal artist in his own right, whether he's illustrating, he can illustrate, he's a film director, I did a film with him called The Puppet Apocalypse, which mm. is a hilarious send-off of uh, alien puppets invade the world and we all get turned to puppets and it's really <laughs> fun and just he he's a mad genius the guy but he had suggested what if we were to do a graphic novel hmm. and 
it was a huge undertaking, unfortunately, which is one of the things that made it maybe not practical for us to approach it that way. But I just recently, because I read a lot of actor and musician autobiographies and biographies, and of all people, Andrew McCarthy yeah. just put out his book, and he kept it really brief, focused on the years that were his biggest years, and he managed to... I love the book, and I love what he did with it, and then it made me start to realize... Maybe if I could focus on those key years, the alcoholism, the drug addiction, where I'm at now, how I view it now, touch a little bit on my upbringing, that maybe there would be something there and it would be it would be a, a fun project and, and maybe something, too, that could possibly help somebody. But um, what about I, uh, res- uh, go ahead. I really respect the craft of writing and I don't consider myself a writer in this way that I just really respect the process. And if I can't do it 110%, I definitely would need somebody. uh, I definitely would want a Mm co-author just to keep me, in a zone and focused and you know there once there was a budget for it but that changed when clerks the original clerks three was off the table now that it's back there might be a chance that that could happen within the next year or two but um what what would the budget be for the uh for well, uh, you know, just money for... Oh, for, oh yeah, yeah, I get you. I get you. Yeah. So, yeah, to be able to sit and write something like that. Yeah. But uh, that yeah. and also to be able to have somebody as a co-author... Right, to hire. Who yeah. could... Right. Well, you uh, know what? It's, I, it's sometimes like you, you know, obviously I do music, you you do music, I act, you act, uh, you know, um, my, uh, my initial... Uh, background was in uh visual arts so like yeah i know how it is to switch between like these different realms and sometimes if you're to get into writing it's like it's almost like you have to be for me it's you have to go down a rabbit hole and just really be in that zone right and then when you come back there you have to look at it and go well that's crap or this is pretty good here let's 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 try all this trail it's a different ball of wax than music or acting that's all i gotta say it's oh, different. absolutely. And, you know, I, I have a bunch of, uh, not a bunch, but I have a handful of uh, what I started to call um, just preliminary chapters of ideas. I started throwing things down. And with my creative writing, uh, with Vicious Dogs, because it was poetry and prose and short stories based on somebody who was sort of in a very strange consciousness. I had a lot of liberties I could take, but doing it without that. Well, what if you were to add something like that in there? Cause like what I'm getting, it's almost like you have a dialogue with yourself as the Scott of today versus the Scott of like 1992. And and you could literally write a dialogue since you're an actor and you're used to looking at scripts. Maybe you could have the two talk about the scenes and set up the scene. And the scene could be the chapter about what happened. Or how, right? right. That, that could be an interesting way to approach it. Just it's, like something off. Even if you don't go with that entirely, that the, those dialogues might be a way to... Oh, sparse. very helpful. Yeah. it's But it's, it's, it's almost like... Uh, going back and watching a performance on film, how critical we are. Yeah. And when I re, some reading, you know, those, that's it. Those words would be set in stone, so to speak, once you're done. Uh, and so much of it, I would read and go, Oh God, like I thought I loved it while I was writing it. Then when I'm reading it back, <laughs> I wasn't loving it at all. Which is why I would probably be looking for 
somebody who I could really trust as a co-author, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully you can find someone, yeah, who can who can bring that spark out of you. We'll see with that. I just, I'm sorry, I, I this thing's going off and I wanted to shut it off. I just want to make sure there's no yeah, emergency yeah. with my loved one. Oh, no, everything's fine. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> okay. Okay. We can never get away from these things, I know. I know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, is there anything else uh, you'd like to add? Maybe this is a good spot to, to sign off, Scott. Um, well, you know, I would, Scott, I want to thank you for your time and for all the support and you've shown me over the years in the friendship. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I, uh, My pleasure, sir. My honor. I, I uh, do admire everything you are doing and have done since we worked together as actors. Um, but I, I think the biggest takeaway uh, I usually will end on is I feel very blessed to have had the opportunities I've had as a result of that crazy little filthy black and white film that somehow is the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I, and, and it's a kick-ass film. It still holds the test of time, I think. And it really, you think about that, uh, it's one of those films back in the day that launched a lot of auteurs making independent film and it launched the whole independent film craze and 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 you know a lot of uh a lot of people have a lot to thank uh kevin smith and and you folks for uh putting the time into that i'm sure it was a crazy shoot yeah well you know but that's a, that's i'm glad you mentioned that that's one of the most beautiful things about it too one of the things we all hear quite often is how the movie inspired the movie inspired me to write. The movie inspired me to do my own movie. The movie inspired me to do my own comic book. Uh, people were very inspired by the film to do their own art. And that's an amazing thing. Well, in a way, it's like... Uh, it's, <laughs> it's the least glamorous film ever. <laughs> right. Amy and Tom... <laughs> one of the one of the funniest critiques we ever were given was in a soundbite makes absence of style a virtue. <laughs> Is well, that not the, that's well, the greatest it's, thing ever? Right? It's, it's such an honest fucking film. I mean. It really is. I mean, it takes balls to, to make that film, uh, you know? It really did. It, it is. It's it. It's hard to not, like, there's very few films. What is it? Something else that's kind of along that lines, but it has a little bit too too much, well, maybe just a little bit too much style to be of that same caliber. <laughs> uh, Living in Oblivion, you ever see that with Steve Buscemi? Oh, it's one of my favorites. <laughs> I mean, it's like, that film is is um, it's so watchable and so funny, man. I watched that the other day with, with uh, not too long ago with my wife, and she's like, "I've never seen this. This is great, you know." And it's so it, ref it's so refreshing to see a film that's honest and doesn't doesn't attempt to try and use you know any kind of slick edits and yeah, exactly. No, uh, that <laughs> Clerks is not a glamorous film, and it's. I was even going to add, it is a working class person's film. There's very right. few films that are like from the gut, like that's a Jersey or it could be Detroit. It could be anywhere working class, you know, and I think that's what people identified with. Uh, many, there's, many people, you know, it was like, wow, this is really honest, man. There's a punk rock. There's a punk rock. Uh, uh, what's the word I want? Sensibility. Just a punk yeah. There's a punk rock aesthetic to the movie, even yeah. though he wasn't a punk rocker. It's it's a DIY, got a punk rock sort of yeah. feel. And that was another thing that really appealed to me uh, once I saw the finished product. And and then we got that wonderful soundtrack from uh, from Sony. Sony came in and they they gave Kevin almost his pick of the litter of some very high end music. Yeah. And 
for years, I remember a lot of people would tell me, oh, Jesus, the best thing about the film is the soundtrack, <laughs> which, which was funny. But because, um, you know, the soundtrack has dialogue sound bites, So you get a little bit of the movie in the soundtrack, which is fun. But uh, yeah, man, it's just been a ride that I never could have anticipated. And uh, again, just really blessed to have been to have seen the ad, to have showed up, to have Kevin say, yeah, that's the guy I want to come back to read from the script and eventually say, yeah, that's my Chulies gum guy. It was just the most uh, wonderful experience because it just opened up a lot of doors. It closed some doors and it opened up a lot of doors, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. Like the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, on that note, thank you so much for uh, staying up late. <laughs> late no, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a vampire. I'll be up all night anyway. All right. Well, I'll call you for another interview in a couple hours here. Don't, all right, if, brother. If, if you're sucking blood out of somebody's neck, I won't, uh, I won't bother <laughs> you. Don't pick up the phone. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Bye. All right, brother. Thanks for listening to the Psychology Talk podcast. Did you know that the Psychology Talk podcast has a Facebook page and an Instagram page? It's true. You can find more information about other guests and episodes, as well as more information about psychology and mental health. And if you liked this episode, go ahead and like us on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Stitcher, or Spotify and leave a review. It helps us grow our audience and provide more quality shows. All material, copyright the Psychology Talk podcast. This podcast is for informative and entertainment purposes only. If you need a mental health professional, please seek one out. Music is provided by the band Serenati. <laughs>